Hello everyone, welcome. My name is James Cook, let's vlog. And today I wanna to talk about the SN8 prototype test that just happened yesterday, because it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. But it was quite a complicated flight, and not a usual rocket flight. And it might be a bit tricky for some people to follow along with the, what the actual achievements really were. So I'm, I'm hoping to sort of maybe demystify what was going on as far as I can. Not that I'm an expert because I'm not, but I am quite into this stuff because I do find it very interesting. Without further ado, let's crack on. first thing to note is that this is a test prototype that is forming part of a development process which should end in the development of a fully reusable orbital class system for getting things into low earth orbit but fully reusable and preferably rapidly reusable as well and for that reason there are some things which are quite unique on this craft firstly SpaceX have gone with a methalox engine so it's burning methane and the oxidizer is liquid oxygen. That means that the engines won't coke up as you use them. So you won't get the same sort of soot deposits as you do Two with minutes, a uh, RP-1 or Kerolox engine, like for example, the Falcon 9 has got, which is great from a reusability point of view, because you know, if you land on Mars, it's unlikely that you're gonna have a bunch of engineers on hand to just sort of climb up in the engines and scrub all of the you know, various bits of deposits out before you can relight to go, no, nope, not gonna happen. So that's, that's where we are with it. In terms of what this test specifically is about, it's about trying to validate some of the aerodynamic assumptions that Tesla have made in the creation of this rocket, and also just a proof of concept that the tanks they've built and the engines they've designed are capable of doing at least a small part of the flight profile. Right. Speaking of flight profiles, I think it's time to Take launch this profile. baby. 10, Ten nine, eight, eight seven, seven, six, six five, five, four, four three, three, two, two one, one, and blast off! Zero. Oh, it's just like something out of like Tintin or sort of old 1930s sci-fi kind of thing. It's like Jules Verne. It's just the whole thing is just so mind-blowing. Anyway, there we go. So it's getting off the pad relatively slowly, so I guess it's quite heavy versus the three Raptor engines that it's got. <clears throat> Obviously, this particular craft is not really designed to take off and just head straight into orbit. Well, it isn't at all. It's supposed to have a giant booster underneath. The reason why they're not developing the giant booster first is because it's very similar to the Falcon 9 booster, at least in terms of principle, the physics of what it has to do in order to launch something on a suborbital trajectory and then return to a landing pad, either on a drone ship or you know, where it took off from. It doesn't, it, it's something that SpaceX have done before and they know how to do it. So what they're trying to look at here is the other bit, how you get the second stage, the Starship itself, back from orbit. Well, they're not actually testing the back from orbit bit because to do that, they would need the big booster to help get it to orbit. And they're just not, they're not ready to commit that kind of resource and time on something which will almost certainly fail. So instead, they just want to launch this up a little way and then have it fall back with the, the flaps controlling its descent. And then it's gonna do a sort of tail down maneuver and land. That's the theory. So, Keep watching this. It's, I mean, it just it, the whole thing is just so mind blowing. Oh, right now that engine that just turned off there. When I first saw it, I thought they'd lost an engine and they were just going to motor on with two and hope they didn't lose a third one. However, I did change my mind about that in a minute or two because, as you'll see, they actually lose a second engine too, and that's when I realised that what they were doing is turning off engines as a way to throttle the amount, the total amount of thrust that the rocket is developing. You see, the thing about these Raptor engines is they're fantastic engines, really amazing. 
but they can probably only throttle down to about 50% of full thrust. And lots of rocket engines can't even throttle that much. A fair few can't throttle at all. So 50% is good, but what it does mean is that if they left all three of them going, then as the rocket got lighter and lighter, it would get quicker and quicker. It would probably break the speed of sound. It would probably go higher than they want. And quite critically, all the engines would turn off before the craft started to fall again, which means there would be a period of essentially totally uncontrolled flight. And that's the thing that SpaceX didn't want, as far as, I mean, you know, I am obviously guessing what their intentions were based on how the flight went, but this is how it looks to me. So I think it's in another few seconds they lose that second engine, or I say lose, turn it off. You can see it sort of gimbal out of the way so that you've got them as far away from the remaining engine that's still operating. And you notice that this engine that's still operating is actually throttled way down itself as far as I can tell, looking at the sort of the length of the, the flame coming out of it. It does look like it's not doing as much work as it could be doing and doing that deliberately because if you if you look at how the clouds are coming out of the back the sort of vapors from the the fuel tanks and the other engines you can see that it's not really going up very quickly anymore in fact it's almost stopped going up at all and that's what spacex want because then they can use that engine you see once while they've got an engine alight they can control the craft as soon as that engine is gone if they're still in the atmosphere, they either need to already be in a sort of belly flop, you know, the sort of like that, or, or they, can't, they can't maintain any control. That's my theory anyway. And it would make sense because this craft is not really designed to control itself fully within the atmosphere. It's supposed to orientate itself appropriately whilst it's still in the vacuum of space. And then it comes into the atmosphere already presenting its belly to the, to the oncoming airstream. All right, here we go, this is the point. And you'll notice as they cut out that engine, it immediately starts falling. There is no point where it isn't either in or entering a belly flop or the engine is on. It's one of those two things. So here we go, and they sort of use the RCS thrusters to sort of try and help push it. And that's part of the reason why they've got to be so careful, I think, with this swap over between vertically ascending and falling belly first. At the moment, it's just got nitrogen cold gas thrusters on it, the same as a Falcon 9. Those aren't very powerful. They, then for a craft this size, I mean, they'd probably be okay in space-ish if they didn't have much to fight in terms of other forces. But, you know, within the atmosphere, what they are going to do, however, is they're going to move to a hot gas thruster at some point, and that's where they'll basically burn some methane and oxygen in a little thruster and generate thrust from that in order to turn the rocket. Once those come on, they should have much more control, you know, across all stages of the flight, I would have thought. So I, I just love the way this thing was falling. It's, I mean, was it falling? Was it flying? I mean, I suppose it was falling the same way you'd say a skydiver was falling but it was definitely falling with style, definitely. And uh, <laughs> it came down quite quickly, actually. It surprised me how quickly it came down, although at the same time, it does appear to just sort of float and hang there. And it, I mean, I, I really didn't know if those flaps were gonna do the job. I mean, they certainly don't look like any kind of rocket control system I've seen on on anything else that's ever gone to space or tried to or been part of a program that would eventually lead to a spacecraft. So yeah, True, truly astonishing work that it did this well on its first outing. Don't forget, the last two attempts were just like little hops with basically just a tank and an engine. This is, uh, this is starting to look like a proper craft. Right, so it's done the flip now and you, you saw it push over and you see that, oh, okay, so that was <laughs> a little bit of fun there. You, you, did you see how the flame went green? Now, from my understanding uh, and what uh, I've heard Elon Musk say on Twitter, what happened was that the header tanks didn't have enough pressure in order to feed the engines with the kind of fuel and oxidizer flow rate that they needed, which meant that uh, they weren't working properly. Now, I have a suspicion 
that it, they were supposed to be landing with two engines. I could be wrong, maybe they were just going to use two to actually do the flip and then just land with one. That's entirely possible. In fact, maybe that's what they were trying to do. But what happened was that that rocket engine, that remaining one, was unable to generate enough thrust because it just couldn't get enough fuel into it quickly enough. That's what, they've, that's what they're saying. Now, the greenness in the flame, I think, is probably copper being burnt away. And they do use copper, I believe, in the lining of uh, certain components. In particular, I think it's used on these ablative, um, not the ablative, the regeneratively cooled bits of the nozzle and combustion chamber. So those are the bits where they actually send really cold liquid oxygen, probably, around in order to keep it really chilled because the, the furnace it's containing is enormously hot. That's, that's the idea. Now, if there wasn't enough fuel pressure or enough oxygen pressure, then what you could have is the regenerative cooling not working properly, and therefore the engine would start to burn and melt away that copper uh, sort of section of the engine. That's what I think happened, and that would make sense. Where SpaceX go from here in terms of development, they will obviously have to find a way to ensure that the header tanks have got better pressure, do some more static fires, and then they're just going to roll out SN9 and off we go. So, yeah, extremely exciting. I was amazed to see the, I mean, it was just, wow, to, to see it as it happened, it was not quite as nerve-wracking as the Crew-1 and the DM-2 missions because they had people on board, but it was quite nerve-wracking because I wanted to see something amazing and oh boy did I. Anyway, well, I hope you all enjoyed that video and, and found the rocket launch to be as fun and exciting as I did. It's certainly going to be an interesting future for us all watching this develop over the next, I was going to say decades, but the way SpaceX are going, it's looking more like, well, what would you say? A couple of, couple of years, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. They, they're moving at speed, which is fantastic. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, remember to leave a like and share it. If you haven't already, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. If you don't already, I want to say a massive thank you to my Patreons. You guys are awesome. And I will see you all in the next episode of my vlog. Bye. So just quickly, I, I know that a lot of people on my channel, a lot of my audience are not particularly interested in space and that's fine, no problem. I love space. So I just got to put this one out there. We'll get back to EVs in the next video. Yeah. I've got a plan to try and work out which one is more expensive, a Tesla Model S or a Ford Fiesta.